Uh, welcome to uh, this afternoon's lecture by Professor Dariusz Stola. My name is Brian Porter Such. I uh, teach Polish history here. Uh, and um, uh, I just welcome, want to welcome everybody on behalf of CREES, um, the Frankel Center, the Copernicus Program, all the co sponsors of, of this visit uh, in this wonderful event. So I as I was uh, preparing, I, I, I've known Darush for a long time, uh, but I wanted to you know, check up on his CV, make sure I had all the titles right. And I didn't find the CV online. Well, I'm sure if I had dug a little further, I could have, uh, because I was immediately distracted by the existence of his own Wikipedia page, uh, something which few of us have, actually. Don't know how you manage that. You have two. I don't know if you knew. You have one in English and one in Polish. Uh, and that was much more fun to read than a CV. Uh, and I found all sorts of uh, um, interesting highlights of his career. For example, in 2013, he was awarded the Knight's Cross in the Order of Poland Reborn. That's my, I hope I'm translating that in the official way. Um, for his scholarship on 1968, very, very important work. Uh, he's received, I learned, the uh, Best History Book of the Year twice from Politica magazine, which is quite a distinction. Um, he has authored eight books, authored or co-authored eight books, and in typical European fashion, more articles than we could fit uh, <laughs> if I read out the titles for the rest of the hour. Um, I just want to highlight a couple of the books, because they're certainly, of, of his many, many works, too, uh, have become seminal and really required reading. Uh, one of them, well, is actually sitting right here. So. <laughs> Uh, it's Klai uh, Bez uh, The Country Without an Exit, uh, with a question mark, very important question mark after it, about uh, uh, migration, emigration from the uh, Polish People's Republic. Uh, that came out in 2010. Uh, and earlier in uh, 2000 was uh, a very important book, Kampania Antisiona Stichna w Polsce. Uh, this is about 1968 uh, and the anti-Zionist campaign. Uh, it's become the standard work on that topic and probably will remain so uh, forever. <laughs> and of course, uh, uh, I, we didn't need Wikipedia to tell us that he is now the director of the newly opened, well, newly, October, well, new enough, uh, Museum of the History of the Polish Jews, uh, which he gave a, a wonderful talk on last night. I suspect many of you were there. But aside from all that, there was one detail on that Wikipedia page that really struck me and has stuck with me. And that is that uh, you were born four weeks after me, uh, <laughs> which has made me feel very, very humble <laughs> that you have accomplished so much uh, in, in that period of time uh, and that you are younger than me. Uh, <laughs> so without uh, further ado, uh, his talk today is called A Country With No Exit. Another question mark. Uh, migrations from Poland, 1949 to 1989. Uh, thank you very much, young man. <laughs> uh, it was a very nice introduction, although I'm a little bit disappointed that Brian has not mentioned that I sing beautifully, too. <laughs> uh, uh, I would like to tell you uh, uh, a little bit about migrations from communist Poland, but also what does migration tell us about communist Poland? Because w w when I re research migration, I have researched both historical migrations dating back to the late 19th century and contemporary migrations in independent Poland in the 1990s. It's for me a, a topic in itself, something which is fascinating in itself when you're a social historian, but also kind of a litmus test of the society where migration occurs. And it's also a way of uh, an angle, a little window through which you can see something about the state where migration takes place. because. What makes domestic migration different from international migration is that people cross the borders. They cross um, uh, the borders of, of states, political regimes, uh, the borders of market, tariff borders, custom borders, uh, which uh, is relatively a novelty. It's about 200 years now that uh, you can notice that you have crossed the border. So this is something about, about modernity. Uh, so. Uh, uh, Communist Poland is an excellent case for investigation for two reasons. First, it was a, a first totalitarian, then authoritarian regime, a, a police state, which gathered incredible amount of data about its citizens. Well, citizen is maybe not the right word for a country when you don't elect the government, 
uh, a denizen probably is a better one, a resident of the country. Uh, incredible amount of data. Uh, today, we have in Poland the Institute of National Remembrance, which is a government agency responsible for holding the archive of the Communist Sec Security Service. And it has some 100 kilometers of files. If you put the files on a single shelf, it would be about 70 miles, as you measure it in this country. And 60% of it are passport files. Uh, and the passport files are mostly passport applications by the citizens of Poland, denizens of Poland, who tried to go abroad and they had to apply for passport to the to, to police. So I, I have seen uh, some of these passport files, including my own. It was really very moving, sentimental to see my own handwriting. My first trip abroad to Czechoslovakia back in the 1970s, the first refusal of my passport, 1983, uh, very moving and the red pencil of the security officer, what was interesting for him, I spoke languages and I had an uncle in England. <laughs> uh, so the first reason to investigate migration from communist Poland is that we have a lot of data gathered by the, by the communist uh, regime. And second, we have it available because we have, a we have had a revolution. So in this country or in Belgium or in France or in West Germany, you don't have access to the police files on, on yourself usually. So this is a blessing of having a communist regime and then not having it mm -hmm. for the past 25 years. Uh, I would like to present you some conclusions of the research. It took me many years, too many years, actually. Uh, and then uh, some 800 pages plus uh, 1,400 footnotes in this volume, which is available only in Polish. So those of you who don't know Polish, it's high time to start learning. Actually, you can take some classes. Uh, uh, where it, this is Eva here, the, the best teacher of Polish in, in, in this country. Uh, and let me start with a, a little prehistory of, of the story, namely that uh, I, begin the, I begin the story not in 1944-45 when we had the first de facto communist government. It was not called the government, it was called the National Committee. There was alternative, legitimate Polish government in London at that time, but the fact was that the communists controlled the territory the territory recently liberated from, from, from the Germans and then occupied by the Soviet army. And the origins of this communist Poland, which the communists themselves were calling People's Poland, they introduced the name of the People's Polish Republic, Polska Rzeczpospolita Ludowa, 1952. I would use it rather anachronically. For me, Poland became a communist country in late 1940s, 48, 49. In 1944-48, it was Poland under communist rule, but not yet a communist country. It was before the communists transformed the political system, the economy, and largely the society. And the, the moment of the emergence of this new Poland is crucial also from the migration point of view. Namely, it follows the decade of most massive population movements in Poland history, and almost all of them uh, uh, forcible. Massive forced migration of the war period and the early post-war years when actually most of the inhabitants of Poland underwent this or another type of, of forced migration, beginning with flight from the hostilities in September 1939, then some of some, some 150,000 people went into exile abroad, then deportations by both Germans and Soviets into occupied Poland, from occupied Poland, uh, of which the biggest one was the forced labor program by the Nazi Germany, which took uh, almost three million people from the occupied Polish territory. Um, then, uh, of course, the Holocaust and most of the, most of the Jews before being killed either in, near a, a, a ghetto or in a, a death camp had been deported one or several times to, from smaller localities to bigger localities or to the concentration camps. So um, virtually it was a massive experience the highest intensity of migration in Poland history ever, and hopefully it will remain so, because it only comes with a catastrophe and massive application of violence, that you uproot millions of people, make them, make them move. And what happens then? And of course, after the war, you have change of borders and related migration, the deportation of Germans in the territory that Poland annexed after the war. Before the war, they had lived some 11 million people, out of which some million and a half were Polish minority. At the last stage of war, about half of them managed to escape before the Soviet army, and for good reasons, especially uh, German women had good reasons to escape the, the Soviet army. 
and the other half was deported after the war in 1945-1948. At the same time, uh, about a million and a half of ethnic Poles and Jews was deported or left the new Soviet Union, the territories annexed to the Soviet Ukraine, Belarus, and Lithuania. And most of the Poles who were deported, who had been deported as forced workers to Germany returned, but not all of them. Some half a million remained abroad, including my uncle, who was the interest of the security officer then in the 1980s. And so you have really massive movement and also something which is internal domestic migration, but within the new territory, that is from central Poland to the newly acquired western territories, Lower Silesia, Pomerania, which was, I would say, from a, for example, from a landscape and architectural point of view, a country abroad. It's been largely German, transformed under German administration beginning in the late Middle Ages. So you have this massive experience of migration, and then comes a period of the lowest migration in Poland's history ever, late 1940s, early 1950s. And again, this is because of the massive use of violence to stop people who want to go, and this is the beginning of my story, namely the introduction of the communist regime in the field of international mobility. So even before this massive, uh, massive displacements of the Second World War, Poland had a very strong tradition of mass migration, including to this country. As you know, already before the First World War, some 3.0 billion people emigrated from then Poland under Russian, Austrian, and, and Prussian rule. In the interwar period, that was more than 2 million people, of whom about a million returned during the Great Depression in the 1930s. So many, many families, Polish, Jewish, Ukrainian, German, uh, not proportionally to the share in the population. Jewish population had a much higher mobility rate than, than, than the Christian population. But the emigration was something very well known, and many people had families, friends abroad. So when the communists decided to close the border, uh, they had to apply violence. And they did it, I would say, in a relatively smart way, namely first by extending the wartime regulation of the state of war, which made some people deported, like ethnic Germans, ethnic Ukrainians, Belarusians, Lithuanians. Uh, and here comes the first peculiarity, what we can learn about the communist Poland. Two groups of people could migrate into, po into the new Polish borders, and these were ethnic Poles and Jews. However, ethnic Poles could not leave this new Poland. Those who wanted to emigrate could not make it legally. The Jews was the only group that could move in and move out. And there is a joke, a saying in Polish, that Jews are like other people, just a little bit more so. So it fits very well with the communist history, showing the peculiarities of the... Uh, formally, for Marxist Leninists, there is not, no such thing as ethnicity, or there should not be. A class is the proper category for analysis. But still, they were using it. And in fact, Polish communists during the war declared that future people's Poland will be a nation state. But it seems they wanted to build a bi-ethnic nation state after the war, by deporting everybody else, but not ethnic Poles and Jews. But in late 1940s, they close the border, and evidently, the signal comes from Moscow. Because it happens everywhere, in all of the Soviet bloc, you, we see massive investment in border and infrastructure by Polish government, and of course, uh, Hungarian, uh, Czech, Romanian, and so on, all along, especially along the western borders. And in Poland, it was a part of the six-year plan. Everything was according to the plan. And in, the, in a very short period, some 1,200 uh, kilometers of barbed wire fence was erected. All the western border of Poland was closed with a barbed wire fence. Uh, there was a watchtower about one kilometer, so which is less than a mile, one from another. So the old joke that Poland was the most funny barrack in the socialist camp was less metaphoric than we could expect. It was looking like a big concentration camp at the western border. Actually, the communists themselves noted that the impression on the population was bad. Uh, the second pillar of the new migration policy was the border uh, uh, protection troops and a new institution without a president in pre-war Poland, which was modeled upon the Soviet NKVD border troops, Pagranicznie Wojska, and in fact, by the Soviet officers. 40% of the officers of these new border protection troops were Soviet citizens. So the proportion was even higher than in the security ministry, Ministry of Public Security, which for me is a message that for the Soviets, this formation, the border guards were important, and they wanted to rely on their own people rather than, than Polish officers. So uh, 
gradually they started to teach new Polish staff of peasant or worker's origin of a proper class basis, prepare them for this reliable, uh, important service in defense of the, of the socialist fatherland, and that was effective. That was effective that in a few years, up to 1952, 53, uh, uh, the border protection or border control became very effective. I know it because I have read reports of illegal crossing of the borders. In addition to the barbed wire fence, there was a, a belt of raked soil, so you can see the footprints of anyone crossing or animal crossing it. So they could relatively easily spot any attempt to cross the border illegally and then follow the, 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 the trespasser. And the efficiency was above 80%. Uh, and we can see the declining number of attempts to, to escape. So I believe that in the early 1950s, no more than maybe 100 people annually could effectively escape from, from Poland. The communists managed effectively to close the country. And as I said, I suppose that beginning in the early Middle Ages, at the origins of Polish state, never was the international mobility as low. Because even in the Middle Ages, where the population was below one million people in the same territory, there were monks, traders, warriors, bandits moving. In the early communist period, it's fully controlled by the Communist Party. We know who went, could go abroad, and these were almost exclusively government officials or party apparatchiks on an official mission. In 1952, the number of people allowed a private trip to a Western country was 52. <laughs> so it was easier to become a government minister. There were 40 ministries at that time, and each minister had a deputy minister, then become a, a tourist to the West. And it was equally difficult to get an immigration permit. At that time, again, about 50 people got immigration permit, which was so the chances of getting an immigration permit was, were close to zero. Exactly, it was 0.002% of the applications were successful. So the passport office was not a government agency to issue passports, but it was a government agency not to issue passports. It was mostly refusing passport applications. But though there were two exceptions to the rule. In 1949, the Politburo made exceptions for two ethnic groups, very strange bedfellows, Germans and Jews. Why? Because almost parallelly, two new states emerged, the State of Israel in 1948 and the German Democratic Republic in 1949. And both governments approached Polish governments, please allow for family reunification. And because at this early stage, Soviet bloc supported Israel, I can remind you that Soviet Union and Poland were among the first to, to recognize the state of Israel. Polish communists agreed, but with a small condition, which was, you will pay us for each Jewish immigrant. And Israel was actually paying per capita, per head. But in a, I would say in a, in a very sophisticated way. There was a trade agreement between Poland and Israel, and simply Poland, if there was not enough immigrants to Israel, Poland was giving a substantial discount on commodities exported to Israel. Uh, and that took some 30,000 people that were, who were allowed to leave for, for, Israel, for Israel at the time. And to Eastern Germany, it was, it was even a bigger number, some 70,000 ethnic Germans who had not been deported before, who, who had been recognized before as Polish minority in Germany, were allowed to leave. Uh, and, but that was, that this is important as an exception to the general rule. The rule was no exit, and an exception which set a precedent for the future. Because then in the late 1950s, early 1960s, these two groups will have a special immigration policy different to, the, to everybody else. But the rule was no exit. And why I believe it was important? Uh, first, quite strangely, being Marxist-Leninist, the communists had a very peculiar approach to labor. For them, workers' labor was the property of the state. They didn't want other states to exploit Polish labor, and they saw it in labor terms. We cannot allow Poles to emigrate to the United States and help American imperialists build a war machine. But interestingly, they also cut Polish migration to Czechoslovakia. Before the war, there was a lot of cross-border traffic. Poles were working in, in industry in, 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 in Moravia. Uh, so even despite the fact that there was a brotherly communist government in Czechoslovakia, 
Polish communists prefer to keep Polish labor for themselves. Why? Because of the very ambitious industrialization programs. And they believe that labor is the source of all the value. So they were, again, in a peculiar way, equally communists and nationalists. And making this research, I understood how important was Stalin's decision not to incorporate Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Bulgaria into the Soviet Union. He could have done it. But for some reasons, which are not fully clear, he decided to establish satellite states. But this subordinate satellite, but still separate state, had their own national dynamic and nationalist dynamic. Every communist leader of each of these states, by definition, was becoming a nationalist. Why? Because he could not make a career up to the Soviet Politburo. The top position he could take was the the general secretary or the first secretary of the Polish, Czechoslovak, Romanian, and so on party, which was changing the way of thinking. And I, I, I realized this working on, on migrations. The things started to change in 1954. And in fact, they started to change in the spring of 1953. And the turning moment is the night of March 5th, 1953, when comrade Stalin dies, the son of all the progressive humanity and so on. Uh, and again, if you are a political scientist, this is strange. Why a death of a single human body has such a tremendous impact on political system? Theoretically, it shouldn't, but it did. After his death, his comrades from the Politburo decide not to kill each other, but to establish collective leadership in terms of Politburo, and they begin reforms. By the way, the head of the NKVD, of the security services, Lavrenti Iberia, was the man behind the reforms, amnesty and so on. And gradually, these policies of destalinization, the Tau, as we call it, reached Poland in about 1954, which included a transformation of the Ministry of Public Security, from where the passport office was removed to the new Ministry of, in of Interior, which was more civilian, less security force than, than before. It also opened new paths of communication with Western governments, including the government of West Germany. Poland didn't have diplomatic relations with, with the Federal Republic of Germany up to the 1970s, but there was a trade mission. Trade relations remained. And during negotiations about, about trade, Germany offered Poland a fantastic credit opportunity, very similar to the Israeli offer back in 1949. And in the last moment, German negotiator said, well, you know, we have a small problem. We will sign everything as you wish, but you must allow for reunification of German families. And we have a nice uh, protocol of the Politburo when they face this choice. They say, okay, let them go. We have troubles. Actually, the six-year plan was collapsing at that time because of overinvestment. Um, a, a communist economy entered economic crisis, and they very much needed, especially very much needed hard currency. And this will become a recurring theme in the migration policy. When Poland needed hard, that means uh, Western currencies, negotiations about um, migration were much more easier. And again, West Germans could use the precedent of the immigration to East Germany. And they reached, initially it was very limited, a few hundred families, then it started to grow. And Almost at the same time, we see a similar reopening of emigration to Israel. Actually, I have located the first woman, a Polish agent planted in the Israeli in the embassy, reported secretly that Israeli diplomats had a party because a woman got a passport. Okay, but that was the first woman after two years of no passports at all. And that was the beginning. And in the next years, uh, um, more than a quarter of a million of people emigrated to both German states, mostly to West Germany, and some 50,000 people emigrated to Israel, and a smaller number emigrated to other countries, England, this country, Canada, France, and so on. So there was a change of policy, which was a consequence of a prior change in the Soviet Union. Namely, signals were coming from Moscow, you can do something about it. That means Moscow opened room for, room for manoeuvre for politicians in Warsaw, and I suppose the same was in Romania, because Romania also changed its policy at the same time and elsewhere, and they reacted, responding to demands by the German and Israeli governments, and then also other governments, French, British, and others. This way, my uncle in England could marry 
his new Polish wife, who left Poland in 1958 this way. So this is a part of my, of my family too. By the way, this half a million Poles who didn't return to Poland after the war were mostly soldiers of the Polish army in the West. So we have a wave of female immigration after 56, the fiancés, wives, joining them, joining them abroad. Actually, 80% of emigrants to England at that time was, was female. So in 56, 58, we have this huge wave of migration. Some more than 300,000 people emigrated. But we also have immigration. Quarter million of Poles and Polish Jews returned from the Soviet Union. And again, this is a part of the Stalinization. Soviet Union allows there is an amnesty. So Polish prisoners leave labor camps and prisons, and they can go. And they are allowed to come back, and then opportunities for other Poles are opened. That we have a massive inflow. And that was one of the reasons why the communists tolerated this huge wave of outmigration. They needed housing and jobs for the immigrants from the Soviet Union. And in a way, these new immigrants were very often taking apartments of the immigrants from Silesia to Germany. But this ended in the late 1950s. Again, we call it tightening of the grip. The, the liberalization ended, but the communists did not return to the Stalinist policies. They decreased dramatically emigration, but not fully. And since late 50s to the 1980, we have it relatively stable between 50 and 30,000 people emigrated annually, two thirds of them to West Germany. And the ups and downs of this number reflected Polish-West German economic relations, basically. So in 1970, when we have negotiations about the establishment of diplomatic relations, Polish government was again using the, the card of, of, of well, it's difficult to call them ethnic Germans, because at different moments of their lives, they declared different identities. OK, I call them Silesians. That's just, well, they, say, they certainly were Silesian. German or Polish is not clear. Maybe they were Polish at one moment and German at another. But what is important for me to get a passport immigration permit and then get the West German citizenship, they had to declare themselves as Germans. And they did it massively. In the meantime, we have the last wave of Jewish immigration, 1968, rather small. It's only less than 14,000 people. But that was the best educated wave of immigrants from Poland ever. Namely, the proportion of people with higher education was eight times higher than among the general population. So this is a part of the story of Polish intelligentsia. But uh, in general, emigration declined this year because uh, uh, of the curbing down emigration to, to Germany. The novelty of the 1970s is not permanent emigration, but it's a liberalization of movement within the Soviet bloc. Beginning 1956, all communist governments started to facilitate tourist movement between their countries. And the first agreement was between Poland and Czechoslovakia about small border movement within a zone along the border, especially in the Tatra Mountains. And then the communists in the 1960s, in a way, tried to imitate what was going on in Western Europe with the European integration and the growing leisure movement from Northern to Southern Europe. And communist Southern Europe was Bulgaria, Balaton in Hungary, and so on. And that was relatively easy. So we have a, we have a steady increase of the number of tr short-term trips abroad within the, within the Soviet bloc. And in 1971, Poland and East Germany reached an agreement about visa-free and passport-free movement. So beginning January 1st, 1972, Poles and East Germans could cross the border just with a regular ID, with a stamp that one could easily obtain at the local police station. So when in 1971, Poles went abroad one million times, it doesn't mean that one million people did it. Some people did it several times. In 1972, it was 10 million times. So what a change. From the period of the lowest international mobility in po Polish history in the early 1950s, we suddenly reached a really a modern era, 10 million trips abroad. And that was a massive experience, especially shopping in East Germany was, was transformative. Uh, and there are plenty of family stories, you know, shoes and uh, um, plenty of things which East Germans didn't like very much. So they had to introduce some limits on what the Poles can buy and what they cannot buy. But certain borders was crossed, and Poles started to move. And in the mid-1970s, other communist governments reached similar set of agreements. And then I still have my communist era uh, ID with a pink stamp, which allowed me to travel to Bulgaria, Romania, uh, Hungary, uh, even the Soviet Union, 
without a visa. Although for Soviet Union uh, and other countries, they introduced special currency exchange regulations. So formally, I, I could go, but I, could, I couldn't get money. There was a limit on it. But you know, there is no such thing as currency you cannot exchange. You always can exchange currency. Okay? If you know the right person, you can always can make it. So what we see in the 1970s is the growing phenomenon of Polish petty trade. Poles became the petty traders of Eastern Europe. And this expanded massively in the 1980s to the to point that the lock and open air markets in uh, Hungary, for example, or in West Berlin were called Polish markets. The biggest open market in West Berlin were called Poland market, because actually a large part of the traders there were, were, were Poles. In late 1970s, after the Helsinki Agreement of 1975, uh, uh, the communist government also changed policy towards short trip, short-term trips to the West. And we see a steady increase. It was a part of the Helsinki Agreement that the communist countries and West European countries agreed for easier tourist movement, family reunification, youth contacts, and so on. And you can see it, it was growing. But still, most of the movement from Poland abroad was within the communist bloc. And that was about seven, nine million trips abro uh, abroad annually, up to the 1980. And in the 1980, as you know, solidarity emerged, Lech Wałęsa, strikes and dines, and so on. And that brought a disaster. Why? Because Czechoslovak and East, government, East German governments immediately closed the border to protect their citizens from the horrible disease of freedom and solidarity. <laughs> so the movement dramatically declined. It declined to a few percent comparing to the 1979, which was really dramatic. But at the same time, under pressure from the solidarity movement, Polish communists lib liberalized passport policy. It became relatively easy to get a passport and go to the West. So the change is that 1981, you have almost the same number of trips outside of the Iron Curtain as within the bloc. So someone said that this year Poland drifted to the West. In migration terms, more people had experience with a Western country than with the Soviet bloc country. Martial law stopped it because most of the passport became invalid on the night of December 13, 1981. And gradually, again, in the first weeks, few people could go abroad, with one exception. Poles working in factories in Czechoslovakia and in Germany. Because what happens in, since late 1960s, Poland having a problem with providing jobs for all the baby boomers, developed uh, agreements with Czechoslovakia and in Germany that was looking for labor. East Germans had a labor deficit, Czechoslovakia had a labor deficit. So Poles from the neighboring regions in Silesia and along the western border were working in quite big numbers, t many thousands of people in German and Czechoslovak industry. So they were the only group allowed to travel. And again, please note the difference with the 1950s. It's <clears throat> formally the same communist regime, the same mo monopolist party, the same Stalinist constitution, <coughs> excuse me, but something has changed. Uh, the restrictions lasted, they were gradually removed in 1982, 83, 84. And in 1985, uh, the passport policy became very similar to the policy of 1970s. However, other communist countries did not return to the old rules. So it was relatively easy to get a tourist passport and go abroad, but quite difficult to go to Czechoslovakia, East Germany, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, not to Hungary. Hungarian government had a different policy. So we see this drift to the West. More and more Poles go abroad, and the abroad is the West. And for example, the fact that after Helsinki, Austria and Sweden did not ask, require visa from Polish citizens. This became the near abroad. Many Poles, instead of waiting in the long queues in front of German embassy or British embassy, as I did, uh, could easily go to Austria, trade the work illegally there, and the number of people working illegally abroad skyrocketed. And the reason was very simple, and that was the black market exchange rate of dollar and other hard currencies. When I came to this country in 1987 uh, to take uh, 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 the great position, first of a busboy and then a waiter in New York, <laughs> uh, after six months of such work with my gay friend Billy being a babysitter, we returned to Poland, and I was a millionaire <laughs> because we had $10,000. And my father's salary, and my father was an engineer, was equivalent of $30 annually, uh, monthly, monthly. So with $10,000, I could live for the next, to the end of my life, <laughs> without working. The, the cause was incredible exchange rate 
black market exchange rate of the dollar. And this black market exchange rate was a consequence of the communist policies, which I can explain if you have a question afterwards. So approaching late 1980s, I, I was in New York in 1987, it was very easy to get a passport for a short trip abroad, but still it was difficult to get emigration permit. So what happened? People started massively to apply for a regular tourist passport and not return. So in the 1980s, we have about a million of so-called overstayers, people who are formerly resident in Poland, never applied for immigration passport. Most of them moved to Germany and the United States. Many of them then legalized during the immigration lottery in the early 1990s in this country. And in Germany, most of them applied for the Ausidle status and became Germans very quickly uh, in, with some 700, 800,000 people this way becoming Germans. So uh, from my point of view, communist regime in Poland did not end in summer of 1989 or September 1989, but in December 1988 when the communist government of, uh, of Rakowski completely liberalized passport policy. They introduced passports which one could keep at home. Up to this moment, after each trip abroad, I had to return my passport to the police station and apply for it when I wanted to go again. And one could keep it for several years. So you see the same Poland, the same Polish People's Republic, the same Stalinist constitution, the same communist monopolist party, and the completely liberal passport policy. And then, the main obstacle for traveling abroad was a foreign visa. And I remember long queues to Western embassies in Warsaw, myself spending a whole night to get American visa, and intimate question that American immigration officer was asking me about my erotic life and so on. <laughs> and of course, I was lying. Uh, so it was no longer the communist security officer that was restricting migration. Now the burden, the cost of controlling migration shifted to the receiving countries. And for me, this is the end of the communist order in Poland and the beginning of new Polish democracy. Uh, Brian gave me a sign that I, I have, yes, exhausted my time, but there is some time for you to ask me questions. I will be happy to, to answer if you wish so. Thank you very much. Yes, please. So it depends when. Uh, certainly in the late 1950s, 56 to 59, it was much easier. Uh, then you have this uh, return of restrictions, but limited. Uh, in the 1960s, it was, I would say, equally difficult as in Czechoslovakia, uh, Romania, Bulgaria. It changes again in the 1970s with the gradual liberalization of movement outside of the bloc. Within the bloc, I would say it was very similar. And the key, fa key factor shaping the relative size of, uh, of movement, let's say, uh, comparing Poland and Hungary, was uh, the amount of money available. Foreigns, Czech crowns or Czechoslovak crowns at the time, East German marks, and so on. So it was no longer passport policy, but rather monetary policy or exchange rate policy of, of each government. Certainly, in the late 1970s, Poland has the most liberal passport policy in terms of travel to the West uh, on a par with Hungary. Hungary had a very liberal policy, but there is a significant difference. Hungarians did not emigrate in such numbers. They had a quite liberal policy uh, after the Kader reforms, you know, beginning in the 1970s, but didn't move massively as the Poles did. And in terms of Poland, the answer to a large extent is family networks, many Poles having families, especially in this country. Uh, so, uh, which always helps migration. People rarely emigrate to the country they don't know. Usually they follow the friends, cousins who have, moved, who have moved in the past. And in the 1990s, it was the economic crisis. You know, Polish communist economy actually collapsed. So Poles had very strong reasons to go abroad. And they were also massively working in other communist countries. In communist countries legally, in the Near East, in Libya, Iraq, and so on. 
So Poland was massively exporting labor, both legally and illegally, in the 1980s. In a sense, what we see in the 1990s is a continuation of a process that began back in the 19 back in the 1980s. So relatively, only Hungary could be compared in terms of liberalism, maybe this is a strong word, of limited restrictions. It was much more difficult to go abroad from Czechoslovakia, East Germany, or, or, or Romania than from Poland. And of course, the Soviet Union too. Yes, please. Thank you for your interesting lecture. Um, on the uh, two exceptions mm -hmm. that you mentioned, the Germans and the um, Jews, uh, in your uh, scholarship mm -hmm. or studies, uh, was there any evidence that the reason uh, beyond accommodating Israel for allowing Jews uh, was to maybe in some ways anti-Semitism at the time? The opposite. Only in 1968, the emigration the, the, the is co correlated with the anti-Jewish campaign, but that followed the, uh, the um, um, severing the diplomatic relations with Israel after the Six-Day War and the general anti-Israeli, anti-Zionist campaign. In 1949, 1956, uh, the biggest enemies of Jewish emigration are Jewish communists in Poland. It, it's evidently because of diplomatic relations, especially some uh, unclear economic deals that I know about one, and maybe there were more of them at that time. Uh, we could say that to some extent in 56, this question of anti-Semitism, it could have played a role in the intra-party struggle between two factions of the Communist Party. That both of these factions, one faction had a very proportion, high proportion of Jewish communists, and they knew about the, about, the, uh, about the prejudice that was not giving them support among the population, while the other faction was blaming Jewish communists for all the crimes and absurdities of the Stalin era. So in this sense, but never directly, I would say 68 also shows how Poland had changed, because this is clearly anti-Jewish, and most of the people who emigrated never reached Israel. They were called Zionists, but only 25% of them went to Israel. 75% well, went elsewhere. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, did you comment on migration from um, the Soviet bloc countries, such as Poland, mm -hmm. to the Soviet Union? If the 19s and the 17s, mm -hmm. I think, it was easier, particularly the second half of the 70s, it was easier to get out to the West mm -hmm. than it was to get into Russia. We had family there. Mm -hmm. we, it was the only place where you really had to have an invitation. Was that part of a bigger policy? Yes. So uh, despite this uh, series of agreements between communist governments to facilitate tourist movement between the countries, and that was a way to imitate Western Europe, strengthen socialist friendship between ordinary people. Uh, but of course, uh, especially Poles had a very bad press among communist leaders as petty traders and people who empty shops, which actually, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, the best example are so-called trains of friendship, pociągi przyjaźni. These were trains with organized tours to visit the uh, homeland of the proletariat, the Soviet Union. And for political reasons, because it was such a propaganda undertaking, the custom control was limited. So some people were calling it uh, mobile department stores, <laughs> <laughs> full of color uh, Russian TV sets, you know, very dangerous objects, and, you know, gold dollars and so on. So instead of, instead of suspending this agreement of visa-free movement, Soviets were introducing half measures, such as, yes, you can freely go to the Soviet Union, but you must have invitations stamped at the police station. And then not less often than every two years. So you can go once in two years. So different, you know, petty uh, hindrances were, were introduced to limit it. But you know, intelligent people, uh, I see it as a kind of a play, a game between centralized bureaucracies and network organized petty traders, smugglers, and ordinary people. And the centralized bureaucracies are much slower to responding. And I will give you an example. Because Polish custom officers try to persecute the well, calling it petty trade is a little bit misleading because each trip was, transaction was petty, but the number of traders was so big that it was massive eventually. When, when, 
total was massive. So some of the petty traders noted that uh, at the Polish Czechoslovak border, custom officers are more demanding. So they were traveling across East Germany. <laughs> okay, this way, from the point of view of Polish custom officers, they went to East Germany. And then they went to Czechoslovakia, maybe Romania, all around. So there were ways to, to avoid it, uh, at least for a time, uh, because before custom officers or border guards or uh, party committees realizes there is a new strategy of playing with the system, it takes some time. And there is a window of opportunity to make some money. And actually in the 1980s, it was highly profitable. Uh, uh, so um, there was a constant game, a race, between uh, enforcement agencies and, and Polish traders. And actually most of Polish tourist movement involved some trade. So when I visited Romania, uh, in 1986, I took with me three pairs of sunglasses, which then I exchanged into, into local currencies, which allowed me to buy a sufficient amount of Romanian wine on the spot. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I kind of participatory observation. <laughs> yes, uh, please. Uh, thank you for it. It is a very good question. It make a because the topic was migration. Sorry. I was not talking about the people who didn't move. <laughs> of course, all the migrants made, uh, made, made a minority. Most of Poles did not migrate, but many of them went abroad for a short trip to Czechoslovakia, to East Germany, uh, to Bulgaria. Uh, in total, between 1949, after the end of the deportation of Germans, Ukrainians, and so on, some two million people left Poland for good. Two thirds of them to, to Germany, some 16, 15 to 17 percent to this country, and then lesser numbers to Israel, France, Great Britain, Australia, and so on. Uh, and about uh, half of them did it in the 1980s. So 1980s, and, and in the 1980s, 80 percent did it in the last three years. So if communist regime in Poland continued with this incredible dynamism, 10 million would have left by 1995. But it didn't. But it didn't. Uh, so Poland lost some 2 million people, which was not much visible as uh, up to the 1960s, Poland had an extremely high fertility rate. And most of the migrants were baby boomers, so the most numerous cohort in, in, in Polish history. Uh, however, as it continued in the 1990s and up to the present, now we can see the secondary demographic effects of of, of migration, but uh, uh, I suppose that a part of the reasoning behind the decision to accept West German demands and allow for greater emigration to Germany in the 1970s was consideration that there is not enough jobs for the baby boomers in the economy. Yes, please. Um, so th you've told us a, this fascinating story yeah. about the, uh, the policy, the, the development of a restrictive mm. migration regime in Poland. But as I listen to this, uh, if I weren't a Polish historian, what I would be hearing is this is a story that's really not communist, but it's modernity, right? The idea of establishing borders, policing them, uh, restricting movement. I mean, towards the end of your talk, you mentioned that there was a shift from policing exit to policing entry. Mm -hmm. Of course, for the individual, it doesn't much matter, you know. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it can make a difference as to which bureaucrat you're going to have mm -hmm. to confront and which bureaucrat you're going to have to tell the intimate details of mm -hmm. your life to, an American mm -hmm. or a, a Pole. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, so, so to what degree do you think, uh, what aspects of your story are specifically communist and what aspects do you think are just part of the development of the modern state? Well, I believe that this non-exit policy of the early 1950s is not just communist, it's Stalinist. Mm -hmm. It was not the case in the Soviet Union before late 1920s. It began with the Stalin rule and the Stalin revolution, collectivization, industrial drive, and then great purges. Uh, actually, it was relatively easy to, to leave the, the, the Bolshevik Russia and then the Soviet Union up to 1927-28. They preferred to get rid of the class enemies and so on, and hence the massive Russian and Ukrainian and Soviet emigration at that time. Uh, and clearly, Poland imitated Soviet Union in restricting exit at the time. 
But I would say from the Polish communist point of view, all the transformation of Poland in the late 40s, early 50s was a kind of a imitative modernization. They did believe that the Soviet Union is the best model to modernize the country, including the restriction on exit and the peculiar way of thinking about labor. Uh, I would say it does matter if the obstacle to migration is exit or entrance. Because when you can exit a country, you have a choice of entrance to many countries. Okay, if you don't get an American visa, you can go to the s South Africa, as many Poles did in the 1980s. When they couldn't get American visa, they got uh, Australian or South African visa. And I have a case of a migrant who applied, who went to Sweden, visa-free movement, applied for refugee status, and then applied for visas to Canadian, American, uh, British, and Australian embassies. And eventually, successfully, he got, I think, an Australian visa at this moment. So uh, it makes a difference. What do you control? Uh, what is communist in addition to this non-exit policy? Yes, it's modernization, but the part of modernization is a growing mobility. So you have a modernization drive because clearly the great industrialization of the early 1950s. The slogan was 50 years in six, uh, half a century in, in six years. You know, great leap forward. But at the same time, you're, in terms of mobility, you return to the Middle Ages. That was something against the, the tendencies of modernity when mobility is growing, including international mobility. You can say that America in the 1920s with you know, quota system made a step against it, yes, yes. Uh, but in general, as you see uh, in the 19th century, the, the, the average mobility of individual human being increased dramatically comparing to the previous millennia, uh, thanks to the new means of transport and so on. Uh, so uh, there was something contradictory in the communist modernization policies. And finally, the passport system had several functions. One was to control movement, and the second was policing the population. If most of the security archive that we have today are passport files, it means most of the information that the security service had on me and my fellow citizens of Poland was coming from the passport system. It was the biggest machine to collect data. You know, actually, I denounced my uncle in England because in the, it, there was a four-page questionnaire passport application, and there was a point, family abroad. I want to have an uncle in England. So this way, a security officer knew I, have, I had an uncle in England. If he was an engineer, they would have approached me to cooperate, as they did Actually, in late 1970s, the security service made more than 100,000 so-called operational conversations with people going abroad. So even if only 5% of, of, of the applicants were cooperative, they could have 5,000 agents more every year. Uh, uh, and, and, and this matters, I think, especially for a police state, it matters. Yes, please. Uh, yes, uh, actually, the Ministry of Interior was the first Polish ministry to get computerized. <laughs> and uh, in the 1980, they introduced a new um, uh, residence registration system, which exists to the, to, to the present. Every citizen of Poland has a PESEL number, which is a date of birth plus, plus, plus a number. And it had a subsystem for passport movement. That means anyone applying for a trip outside of the Soviet bloc when leaving Poland, was leaving a little green slip of paper with the border guard, and when returning, the, the, the other half of the slip of paper. And then they were in putting data into the computers. 
The problem was in the 1980s that the system collapsed because of a huge number of, of trips. <laughs> and I found a nice report that uh, I think it's uh, late 1988 that uh, in a um, provincial police headquarters they have a million of these green slips and they don't know what to do about them. <laughs> Uh, so, but up to the 1988, between 1980 and 1988, it was a relatively reliable source of data. And a friend of mine wrote a dissertation on the basis of this data. So we know what was the age, education, uh, region of origin, where they, maybe not they moved, but they declared were going. Uh, and how many of them did not return up to, to the end of 1988? So uh, uh, again, you have, a, you have a police state, now with computers, and then a revolution, and we can access, we have access to this. Yes, please. Were, remiss were financial remiss remittances from the people who emigrated a significant, uh, did they affect the economy significantly in Poland? Actually, that was the reason for the liberalization of passport policy in the 1970s and 1980s. In the early 1970s, Poland opened its economy and took massively credits. The idea was to modernize the industry using um, Western capitalists instead of squeezing down consumption in Poland. Uh, but it turned out that the Polish exports were not competitive, and then recession came in the mid-1970s, and all the, all the program collapsed, and Poland was practically uh, bankrupt. No one called it, but practically Poland was not able to save its debt. And then, already in the mid-1970s, advisors and the Minister of Finance realized that you have that many Poles have about uh, a billion of dollars in the houses, in cash, plus massive Polish diaspora may have additional billions of dollars and what to do, how to attract this money. And there were two ways of making it. First, they opened a chain of dollar shops, Pevex. Anyone who was in Poland in the 70s or the 80s? <laughs> yes. So these were, originally these were shops with imported goods, but gradually they introduced domestic products, including vodka but also apartments, cars, uh, commodities in high demand, which one could buy paying with foreign currency. And this, actually, that was the, the most important factor shaping the overvalued exchange rate. Why? Because if you can buy a bottle of vodka in a regular shop for 100 zloty, and you can buy it for $1 in a Pevex shop, the exchange rate for a dollar is 100 zloty, while the official exchange rate is 27 zloty. And actually, the Politburo knew it. I read the report from the National Bank of Poland that you must do something about it <laughs> because we are inflating exchange rate of the dollars. But they never, so they knew it and they didn't change it. They so much needed foreign currency. So this policy of tolerating temporary movement but still restricting immigration was to tolerate labor migration of Poles. And this way, Poland in the 1980s was actually a country of two currencies. Well, maybe free. It was Polish złoty, American dollar, and German Deutschmark. And in fact, because of high inflation in the late 1980s, uh, bigger transactions such as buying a flat, buying a car, were made in foreign currency. So in the late 1980s, uh, sorry, the second way was opening dollar accounts in state-owned banks, the Pekao Bank, with very attractive interest rates. 10% annually. So in the late 1980s, by the black market exchange rates, Poland kept more savings in dollars than in Polish currency. And the revenue from the Pevex shops and the remittances made 40% of Polish revenue in foreign currencies in general. So they went into a trap. Even if they wanted to cut this movement, they would make Poland completely bankrupt. So uh, what is interesting, the hardline communists who were lobbying against opening Polish economy to the West in the 1970s, they were right. Uh, yes, please. Thank you for that. Imagine writing the beginning agenda around 50 people who were going to be Actually, I don't know their names. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't find the files, but I know that, for example, some embassies exerted diplomatic pressure to release some members of important families who had cousins abroad. Uh, I suppose that some of them were simply agents of the communist security. 
uh, you know, but when you have 50 immigrants, I don't know how many. And then you have some people who had connections. You know, there is a saying, when you have connections, you don't need protectia. Uh, and that works even under very harsh regime. I know what was the decision-making process. The decision-making process in the early 1950s was one had to apply to the passport office, one in all of Poland, so one had to travel, which was open twice a week for two hours. <laughs> then the clerks in the passport office were checking this long application, six pages at that time. My favorite question was the last one. It was other important information. <laughs> you know, it's highly sophisticated psychological question, which means, what do you think you should tell us? <laughs> okay. Then a security officer reviewed and wrote a justification to give permission or not to give it. But he had very strong reasons not to advise to give the permission, because he knew that the director of the office will review his proposal. And the director was a similar position, because he knew that the file would go to the Minister of Foreign Affairs for consultations. And from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, it will go to the Party Central Committee for the third review. And with the free opinions from the Passport Office, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and the Central Committee, it will be reviewed by a top commission of four members of the Politburo who will make the final decision. So all the people in this chain of decision making were enemies of the applicant because they knew they will be punished if they are excessively liberal. But from time to time, they had reasons to, to allow for it. Yes, please. Very good question. Actually, I have the first signs of corruption in mid-1950s with the liberalization. Before that moment, exactly before of this long chain of decision-making and very tight control, and the practice of critique and self-critique. Uh, to give you an example, I found a beautiful protocol of the party meeting within the passport office, when party members accuse each other of excessive liberalism. <laughs> you know, if, if very harsh language, and that was, that was serious. Because being a, an employee of the Minister of Public Security and not showing proper vigilance, what could easily end on the other side of the, of the bars? Beginning 56, we have the first signs, there are reports coming to Warsaw that some people who shouldn't get a passport get a passport. And then with the decentralization of the decision making in 56, 57, when the decision is being made in the regional, provincial offices. There is no further review, especially to Germany and to Israel. And then it's very clear. And then we have a kind of a pluralization of passport policy. For example, it was very difficult to get an exit permit in the voivodeship of Szczecin, province of Szczecin. So some people were moving to Katowice to get the passport in Katowice. And clearly, officers in Katowice were somehow more sympathetic <laughs> to the applicants. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for your questions.